1 John chapter 3. We'll start in verse 2. We got past this two weeks ago. Owen, oh, appreciate Cotty uh, teaching class last week. I know you all enjoyed that for a break. We all had a good part of it. Well, good. I'm glad. And, and we had a great visit down at Wellington. That's a nice congregation. They treated us well. And then, of course, we had to run down to Dallas after that. So it was a really, really full week. And I'm glad that I don't have to go anywhere this week. It's just a, that you, you just run out of time in a hurry when you have to do that running around. But um, I wanted to go back and take a look beginning in 1 John 3 and verse 2, because there's a phrase there that has always fascinated me. And I'm not sure exactly what to do with it. Uh, we'll take a look at the statement in its context. And then you can put up with my little flight of fancy that I've always just wondered about. And maybe maybe you've thought about it too and have some some ideas about it, but let's read beginning in 1 John 3, verse 2, and uh, read down through verse, let's just stop at 6. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And he's going to say more that's challenging along that same line in the verses to come. But the, the phrase that jumps out at me is, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, the whole context has to do with purity. Starting back, um, uh, in, well, at least verse 29, uh, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So the idea that because Jesus is righteous, his offspring or his brothers and sisters through God are also going to be pure. And then after this phrase, he talks about sin being lawlessness, breaking the law, and anyone who goes on sinning uh, neither knows him nor has seen him. So this idea that somehow our relationship with Jesus will help us to become really righteous, non-sinning people. Uh, the one little phrase in there that kind of helps me is that, you know, he came to give, to take away our sin. And I, I went back to the Greek and looked at this word all the way through this passage. Every time you see the word sin, uh, it is representative of the word hamartia. And I always heard that hamartia means missing the mark. And that made sense to me, okay? I'm aiming at something, I shoot at it, but... You know, I don't hit the bullseye, I hit the yellow, or I you know, hit out to the side or whatever. But there's another uh, usage of the word in literature. And in literature, it has to do with that tragic flaw that every hero has. Like a hero who loves his friend so much that he lets himself get sucked into to a problem that he can't get out of. Or uh, Hercules... Was it Hercules that had the heel? No. Achilles. Achilles, yes. who, who had the heel, right? He was dipped in the river Styx. They held him by the heel, and so all of his life he was able to defeat anybody. Nobody could kill him, but there was always that Achilles heel. So uh, there's that idea that we have control of a lot of things, but maybe there's that one particular tragic flaw that we have that we have difficulty overcoming. So we'll talk about it in, in both ideas here in a little bit. But this idea that we will be like him for we will see him as he is triggers in me this desire to know what it's like to not be 
in the human experience anymore, right? Um, when he returns, when he comes back, so uh, into the world, judgment day, uh, final resurrection, all of those things seem to be part of the idea. What will it be like for us to be like Jesus in his resurrected form? What kinds of things might we expect to be true? And keep in mind that John saw some stuff while Jesus was on the planet that even before his death and resurrection were you know, beyond anything that was natural, normal, right? Uh, when Jesus goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says that his appearance was changed, right? It was altered. He became white as the light. So in the spiritual realm... Uh, is our is there a glow to people in the spiritual realm? Uh, they saw both uh, Moses and Elijah, and somehow recognized that that was Moses and Elijah. Unless Matthew and Luke leave out the introductions, you know, where Jesus says, you know, Peter, this is Elijah, Elijah, this is Peter, then they just knew when these guys show up on the mountain that that's who they were, having never seen them before. So does that mean that in the spiritual realm that we'll know people spiritually that maybe we never met physically? And that's always been my answer to people who say, well, we know each other in heaven. I think we'll know each other, and I think we'll know everybody else. I don't think it will matter as much as we think it will, but I think that there won't be anything blocking our knowledge of who folks are. So the first time you see the Apostle Paul, I think you'll know that's the Apostle Paul. The first time you see Jesus, I think there'll be any doubt in your mind that that's who you're looking at. So again, these are thoughts, not necessarily biblical, you know, absolutes, but I wonder about these things. Um, if in the physical realm, the body is in control of where the spirit goes, right? If, if my spirit wants to be in Dallas, I have to get in a car and drive and take my spirit to Dallas. Right? My spirit does not want to be in Dallas. But when my spirit was in Dallas and wanted to be back in Shamrock, you know, I had to get in the car <laughs> and drive back to Shamrock. Uh, because my spirit had no rest, right? But my spirit can't do anything about it because my body is where my body is. Do you think that when we're resurrected that our spirit will be in charge and our body will have to go where our spirit wants to go? And the reason I ask that question, when Jesus is raised from the dead, he does something that's really odd and different uh, on the evening after he's met uh, Mary in the garden in the morning he goes and he meets with 11 disciples in the evening in that upper room they're kind of hiding out they've locked the doors and it says then Jesus stood in the middle of them well how did Jesus get through the locked door into the middle of the group well, he is a resurrected being. He's not playing by the same rules that the non-resurrected beings are, are having. If Jesus had wanted Peter to come outside the door, he could have not, and Peter would have had to go over, open the door, go outside. But Jesus does not. Jesus says, I'm going inside, and he's just inside. And you say, well, that doesn't count because Jesus is Jesus, right? Jesus can do anything he wants to. If Jesus had wanted to do that when he was alive before the resurrection, could he have done it? I think so probably, right? But it's interesting to me, those things. Uh, he was seen by people who had known him for years but did not know him after his resurrection. He's in the garden. Mary comes up and says, what have you done with his body? If you'll tell me what you did with his body, I'll take it and I'll take care of it. And then he says her name, Mary. 
And as soon as he says her name, then Mary knows who he is. There's two guys walking along the road to Emmaus. Jesus joins himself to them. They're walking along, and they're telling Jesus all the stuff that happened to him over the weekend. Right? Uh, we thought that he was the Messiah. We thought that he was going to return righteousness to Israel, but now they've killed him. He gets to the place where they're staying. He takes the bread. He breaks it, and immediately they know who he is, and as soon as they know who he is, he vanishes. He just leaves them. There's just a a lot of oddities when it comes to physical appearances after his resurrection. And I wonder if our appearance physically will just not matter much at all after the resurrection, but that spiritually we'll be connected or that we'll know uh, one another because of that. Uh, particularly in this context, there'll be no more concern about sin if the Spirit is in charge, then the Spirit can decide not to have those impulses and desires. The physical body being in charge, the Spirit wrestles with the body. But even the Apostle Paul says, the things that I don't want to do are the very things that I do, and the things that I want to do are the very things I leave undone. And he uses a neat phrase. He says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? Well, that, you know, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is, makes me think, well, finally, delivered from all of that. No more temptation because the spirit is completely in control. All right. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Does it ring true, even if it, you know, if we, we can't book chapter and verse on this one, I'm afraid. But have you thought about those things? what it's going to be like. Spiritual body. Yeah, the, the spiritual body. It's a different thing. Um, and I know some people that just think of it in terms of, okay, I was dead and now I'm not dead anymore, but I'm still just kind of who I am now. Um, that's no bargain, uh, you know, to live eternally with, with, <laughs> with, with the same problems we've got now. Yeah. Uh, physically, no more death, no more decay, no more tears. Uh, all those kinds of things ring true. Uh, part of the reason for that, I think, is just that the spiritual has taken over from the physical. Anybody else? Thoughts? Well, my mm -hmm. sons and I have always discussed this. Mm -hmm. And they always think that they're going to get to heaven and they're going to see their grandparents and they're going to see... I don't think they will know them. You don't think we'll know each other? No. Okay. I, I, there's a lot of people that agree with you that if we didn't know each other on the physical side, we won't know each other on the spiritual side. I just think that the spiritual side is so different that things that are spiritually discerned rather than physically discerned, like we wouldn't recognize them if we saw them physically. Their physical appearance wouldn't immediately tell us, oh, that's grandma. But something about their spiritual side might. And again, I don't know for sure, but I'd like to think so. Uh, there are some folks that I never met, uh, or as a child I met them, but I don't remember meeting them. Like you say, you know, my, I knew both sets of grandparents until I was close to 20 years old. My mother's mother lived with them till I was in my 40s, I guess. She lived a long time. But her mom died fairly early in my life and I never met my great greats so you know there's you wonder if there'll be some kind of uh, spiritual connection even though there's not a, a physical but I can't prove it to you from scripture one way or the other anybody else well, you, you says, think so when the time comes the end shall come mm -hmm. the body will return back to dust right yeah. but the spirit goes back to the father absolutely so, now, Jesus had a body when he came up. It wasn't a disposable dust body, but he had a body. And he was interested in um, his apostles knowing that. I wrote that down just to make sure I remembered where it was. It's in Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. 
And then we'll look at one in John that's kind of from the same occasion, I think. Luke 24, 36. That they're discussing uh, the, the two guys on the road to Emmaus. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. So why does he need flesh and bones other than maybe for an appearance to them? I mean, if he, He's truly a resurrected eternal spiritual being, but in his encounter with them, he has flesh and bones and wants to make sure that they realize that, that he's not just an apparition. He's not just a ghost. Look at John 20. John 20, we'll look at verses 19 and 20. John 20, 19 and 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, uh, Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's kind of interesting. He breathed on them. Right? So uh, he has flesh and bones. He's breathing. He's talking. Uh, it's interesting. Why does he need all of that? as a resurrected being? And will we have similar experience where our physical earthly body goes back to the dust, but God provides us with an eternal non-disposable body that still has some of the same characteristics? Flesh and bones and breath, do we need that? Um, is this just a way that humans could encounter with Jesus and understand Jesus a little bit better? Is that why he did it that way? I honestly do not know. But John seems to think that when we see him as he is, that we'll be like him as he is. Right? Well, back to that first thought. The context is talking about sinlessness. Right? So when we see him as he is, we'll be like him as he is. Is it more a thing about this final purity? Right? Everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself. And then he says those who are uh, in Christ don't sin. If you go on sinning, no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Right? This is 1 John 3. Let's keep reading in 7, 7 through 10. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he, that would be Jesus, is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. And, you know, you know John. He's going to get back to, to talking about loving each other. He's not going to stay off that subject very long. But in the meantime, he's talking about getting to a place where we are not going on Sinning, and that's a good translation of the Greek. And I don't do Greek well, but the uh, the folks I've read behind who do Greek well say that what we're looking at is a, a particular tense that means it starts, but it doesn't end. It's something that's ongoing. It's a it's a continuous action. And so when it says 
the one who is in Christ does not sin. And I think, does the King James just have that does not sin? Does anybody have the King James in front of you? Look at uh, 3, uh, 9. No one who is born of God does not sin. Just does not sin. His seed remains in him and he cannot sin. Okay. So the, the, the NIV tries to translate this ongoing tense. The idea is not point action. In other words, we're not talking about a sin. We're talking about a lifestyle of sin. So if you're in Christ, you don't go on with a lifestyle of sin. Remember the people that John is trying to write against, the Gnostics, would say that once you're spiritually pure, it just doesn't matter what you do with your body. Some of them even <coughs> taught that the more, you, the more you pleasured the body, the better, because that showed that you fully understood that you were free. Right? My spirit is free, therefore my body can do whatever it wants to do. And the more I do that other people would consider sinful, the more they understand that I truly am free. What does it sound like? Does it not sound like some of that that came out of the 60s? This idea that, you know, the, the more pure my heart is, the more pure my soul is, the more physical sin I can commit. Uh, so John is not just saying you need to be pure. He's saying don't take on the attitude that says, by having a spiritual relationship with Christ, then your body can just live any way your body wants to live. So the translation goes on sinning or does not go on sinning is a good translation. It makes sense in the context. It's not something that we just keep doing. Um, there's a, a quote from William Barclay that I wanted to share. Uh, to remember the presence of Jesus Christ forever with us is to make sin always difficult and sometimes even impossible. So keeping Christ in mind, uh, what John said earlier in the letter, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Christ goes on forgiving us from all of our sins. Well, what would there be to forgive if the Christian never sinned? If it's just point act, you know, if we're just talking about uh, a person who commits any sin ever, uh, then there's no way to walk in the light, there's no way to be, have fellowship, there's no way to be forgiven. But if we walk in the light, we have that attitude of the presence of Christ. And according to Barclay, I think it's a great quote, uh, it makes sin always difficult and sometimes even impossible. That we're just that resistant to the temptation of sin. Again, the Gnostics would have told them, why would you resist? You know, if, if it feels good, do it. Just be part of whatever your body wants to be part of. But John says we can't just go on sinning and then say we have a relationship with someone who's righteous. Now, when we see him, we will be like him before, because we will see him as he is. His, his entire purpose for saying that may have been to say at some point all of this will be a moot point. Once Jesus has redeemed us from our sin, once we're raised from the grave to be with him as he is, then we're pure. Uh, there's no sin in heaven. There's nothing there that would cause an abomination. You'll always be right because we'll be in the presence of the Lord. So we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. Makes sense in that context that John built around the idea of living lives that, that just don't go on sinning. Any thoughts on that? Does that make sense? What John said makes sense. What Barclay said makes sense. That stuff I put in the middle, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> For all have sinned and fallen short. Absolutely. And, and even later on, John's going to talk about uh, everybody sins, he says, but there's a sin that does not lead to death. And we'll, we'll struggle, try to figure out what he was talking about there. But he, he keeps talking, if if a man says, I have not sinned, he's a liar. Well, then he comes back and says, uh, if you say that you're in Christ but you sin, so again, it's that attitude, it's that ongoing desire to fight against the physical 
to try to nurture the spiritual until we see him as he is and we're like him, that the physical is no longer a problem. 